that, man, if you know you are blessed and that you know the Lord's countenance and his grace is just shining all over you, man, you all just put some emojis in, clap your hands, whatever the case is. Happy Mother's Day. I'm so grateful that you are watching. You are probably watching if you're blessed to be able to do this. Many of you may be watching with your mom. And some of you don't have that opportunity because mom has gone on to be with a better, in a better place. But whatever space you find yourself in today, take a moment and give God thanks and praise for our mothers. And so come on, can we clap our hands? Can we give God thanks and praise for our moms? Hallelujah. As a matter of fact, would you do this real quick? Would you just type in your mama's name? And just say, thank God for my mama. If you're, if you're a mother right now and you're, you're with us worshiping, would you just type in, you know, you know, your name? And I'm a mom from Philadelphia. I'm a mom from Rocky Mount. I'm a mom from Wilson. I'm a mom from Tarboro. Wherever you are, type that in. We celebrate you today. And so, come on, let's, let's pray. I want to read starting in Luke chapter 1, uh, verse number 39, as we finish out this sermon series. It's been a blessing to you. If this sermon series has been a blessing to you, type that in. It's been a blessing for me to be able to preach it. And so I want to finish this sermon series on hidden figures. And so let's talk to the Lord on this Mother's Day, and then let's look at the word together as a family. Lord, you've been our dwelling place in every generation. From everlasting to everlasting, you never cease to be God. Thank you for this wonderful Sunday worship. Thank you for this opportunity to gather as sons and as daughters. We celebrate motherhood. We celebrate womanhood. We celebrate all that you're doing in the lives of your people. We pray now, God, that today you would grant us a word that we will live and not die. A word, God, that when we're done worshiping, we're better than how we began worshiping. Today, God, on this Mother's Day, I pray you would heal and deliver. I pray on this Mother's Day you would save for your name's sake. I pray, God, on this Mother's Day you would gently massage the hearts of those who are worshiping that can't be with their mothers because they've already gone on to be with you. I pray, God, for those who can't be with their mothers because they may be in a different city or a different state, maybe hospitalized, maybe undergoing surgery, and then, God, for others we celebrate the fact that you've blessed us to be able to still have our moms. Whatever our situation is, God, I pray that you would speak in the midst of it. So, Lord, now grant us information, inspiration, and implementation. Speak, Lord. We're listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Thank God for mom. Luke chapter 1, verse number 39 is where I want to begin reading. Again, shouting out all of the mothers, happy Mother's Day to my mother and to your mother, happy Mother's Day uh, to my wife, happy Mother's Day to all of the mothers that are worshiping with us today. We celebrate you. We celebrate you. Luke chapter 1, verse number 39. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. She entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed there will be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Say amen if you can. She, you know that's the beginning right there. As a matter of fact, the pericope of your Bibles talks about it. Starting at verse number 46, she begins to sing she writes this poem. She sings this song that we call the Magnificat. Today on this Mother's Day, I want to unpack this text and preach from the subject, grateful praise. Grateful praise. In this sermon series, we've already discussed looking beyond or life beyond our worst moment. We've talked about moving from shame to fame. 
Sermon number three, we talked about breaking barriers. Sermon number four, we talked about the balance that blesses. And today on this Mother's Day, I want to talk about grateful praise. I want to talk about grateful praise on this day that we honor the one human being that unselfishly gives herself to her children time and time again. Come on, somebody type in and shout out. Thank you, mama. I think for too long as men, too long as a society, we have allowed men to dictate and determine how women are viewed. And in this series, we've attempted to take a fresh look at women. That's a great word. I want to remind you before next week we move on to the new sermon series. All of us need a fresh look in our lives. And in this sermon series, we've had a fresh look at women. The truth of the matter is all of us have blind spots. I certainly have mine. All of us have our inability to see things from the lens of other people. And oftentimes, as we examine the women of the scriptures, we have villainized them. We have marginalized them. And in this sermon series, I'm attempting to give us a fresh look, a fresh perspective, because the truth of the matter is all of my life, I've been a man and the rest of my life, I'm going to be a man. Come on, where my men, where my men. I've never felt the stuff women have felt. I've never felt what it was like to be pregnant. I've never felt what it was like. To, to give birth to a child. Thank you, Jesus, for that. I don't know all of the any of the issues and struggles. I've never had to choose between raising a family and whether or not I would pursue my career. I've never had to deal with some of the struggles. And the reality of it is what we need to do as we take a fresh look at women. We need to allow them to tell their story from their character and from their lens. There are some amazing portraits of womanhood and motherhood in the Bible. We see examples like the mother of Moses. She literally broke the law so that her son could grow up in faith. We see the sacrificial love of the mother of King Solomon, who told him that she was willing to have her son taken away and raised by somebody else rather than to see any harm come to him. We see examples of the mother of James and of John, who loved her boys so much that she wanted them to sit by the Lord's side in the heavenly kingdom. And when we begin looking at scripture, when we begin looking at scripture, we see no greater example in the scriptures than the Virgin Mary. The truth of the matter is that I normally will only preach this text around Christmas time. But the Lord has dropped this in my spirit as this last Sunday we look at hidden figures. Because when we start looking at the women in the Bible and the mothers in the Bible, we see perhaps no more prominent example in Old and New Testament than we do the Virgin Mary. She occupies a unique prominence in Scripture. And can I just park here for a moment? Because I think oftentimes, y'all, we don't recognize how far she's come. And what I mean by that is and we live in a society and a culture today where there are statutes of Mary, where where people pray prayers to Mary, where she has really been elevated in the psyche and the emotion of people that she is celebrated for whose whose mother she is. But I want you to recognize when we begin looking at her in the beginning of the pages of scriptures, She was frowned upon by society. She kind of reminds me of a female version of Martin Luther King. Many of us know that the Martin Luther King that is celebrated now was hated while he was alive. The many people that are on on his side of of his nonviolent perspective now and who read all of his literature and his poems and his essays and, and who quote his speeches. Many churches will not even let him in their church. So it's interesting that, that and, oh, I hear the Holy Ghost. This is the word, y'all. It's inter- interesting how there's been a recovery of her respectability. There's been a recovery of her reputation. That the Mary we now celebrate is different than the one historically that we see in the scriptures. And I think all of us bring cultural assumptions about motherhood, cultural assumptions about womanhood about how we depict Mary. And I want to speak this over some person's life that's listening to this this sermon today on this Mother's Day, that that God is about to recover your reputation, 
that there's going to be a recovery and a respectability that's going to be reattached to your name, that people that saw you down and it's less than in the past is going to see you in the fullness. Somebody shout fullness. They're going to see you in the fullness of who you really are in Christ. They're going to see you for how God has made you. They're going to see you for what your purpose is. And we start looking at this depiction of Mary. We start to see that we've got to start letting the scriptures speak for her character themselves. The truth of the matter is, y'all, Mary, Mary was not some nice girl. What do you mean by that? I don't mean in, a, in an immoral way. We know she was highly moral. But she was not some meek, mild, mind your own business girl. No, no, no. Mary, Mary, in fact, um, Mary scared nice, passive girls because the reality of it is Mary was dangerously active, dangerously active. Instead of minding her own business, she was minding the business of Herod. You start looking over and over again through the pages of the scripture. She was oftentimes found minding the ministry business of Jesus. And y'all, we see an example of this Mary now who literally in this passage, the Magnificat begins to respond. I'm there almost to respond to everything amazing that God has done and is going to do in her life. Now, watch this. The Magnificat that I began reading, my soul magnifies. That's why it's called the Magnificat. My soul magnifies the Lord literally was written at a time. She spoke it at a time. She sung it at a time when there was both blessing and difficulty in her life. Understand something that this was an unwanted pregnancy. This was not a situation she thought she would be in or she even wanted to be in. And what blows my mind is that even though she knows that her future is about to be difficult, even though she knows that she has to get back home and deal with the attitude and the disposition and what everybody's going to say, and even how Joseph feels, even in the midst of chaotic circumstances, I want you to grab this, even in the midst of it, she still praises the Lord. And I want to park here for a moment and say to somebody that God is saying on this Mother's Day, it's time to raise up uh, in spite of praise. Yep. God has been good. I know it's going to be hard, but you know what? I'm going to praise him in spite of, in spite of what folk have said, in spite of what my future may look like, in spite of how things may get, in spite of the road being rough for a while, in spite of having to go through chemo, in spite of the radiation, in spite of what the doctor says, in spite of my husband and my my struggle in my marriage, in spite of what's happening in my children's life. We've got to learn to give God praise in spite of what's happening. Anybody here have an in spite of praise? You know what? Nobody's going to make me shut my mouth. I might even be losing right now. I'm still going to praise him. I might not know what tomorrow's going to bring. I'm still going to praise him. I don't have any guarantees that it's all going to work out like I want them to work out. But you know what? I'm going to give them praise. Mary recognizes that our praise to God has to be in spite of. Yeah, and let me tell you what blows my mind. This is not some emotional praise because I know that's what you're thinking. Well, Pastor, you know, sometimes we have a tendency to treat worship, to treat music, in some regards, even to treat preaching, almost like it is a form of anesthesia. You know, I'm going to come into worship. I'm going to, you know, uh, one writer called religion the opiate, the opiate of the people. And we've got to be careful that we don't anesthetize ourselves, that we don't numb ourselves to the reality of what I'm really dealing with. Mary was not in denial about the fact that she was pregnant. She's not in denial about what people are going to say about her. She's not in denial about what the struggle may be for the man, Joseph, that she's betrothed to. She's not in denial about any of that. But the reality of it is she recognizes, I want you to grab where I'm about to go. She gives God praise, but it's not just head. It's head and heart. It's it's not just emotion. It is based on something intellectual. It's based on something experiential. As a matter of fact, what blows my mind when I read the Magnificat 
is that it is written almost from the lens of a skilled theologian. It, she's writing this from a lens of broad Old Testament understanding. And I want to park here for a moment because the Lord put this word of wisdom to share with the congregation. And this is what the Lord, I wrote it down because I didn't want to say it wrong. And this is the word he told me to give word Tabernacle Church. What he wants to do next is going to be a byproduct of the word that is in you already. What he wants to do next in your life is going to be a byproduct of the word that is already in you. Let me tell you why this matters. Because sometimes we want God to move, but we don't have any word to help ground it. We want God to show up, but we don't have a word to ground it. We're saying, God, I want you to heal me. He's saying, then give me a word about healing. God, I want you to restore. Then give me a word about. God, I want you to prosper me. Then give me a word about prospering me. What I want you to grab, y'all, is that the Magnificat was saturated in the word of God. And what God wants to do next in your life is not going to happen unless your life is saturated with the word. And I'm hearing the Lord say to us, say to us, whether it's in music, whether it's in our businesses, whether it's in our finances or our economy, whether it is in our ministries, whether it is in our marriages or our homes, whether it's in how well we accomplish and succeed at school. He is saying to us, I'm only going to move to the extent that the word is already in you. Woo, God. And so many of us want God to move beyond the word that is in us. And if we want God to move in our lives, somebody put your hands on yourself and say, I need the word of God in me. God, I need your word in me. And as your word begins to saturate me, then what's in me, what's in me is going to come out of me. And so oftentimes we want something grand and something large and something significant and something honoring and something praiseworthy to come out of me. But I don't yet have it in me. That's why. Every opportunity I get to sit under the word, every opportunity I get to study the word, every opportunity I get to sit on the word, every opportunity I get, I've got to take it because God's saying whatever I'm going to do is going to be a byproduct of the word that is already in you. Mary's Magnificat was saturated in the word. Let me say two things about this very quickly. I'm almost at my introduction. I'm almost done my introduction. Hang in there for just a moment longer. He's saying this moment, this word must be understood. See, as Mary begins to share the Magnificat, my soul magnifies the Lord. Verse 46, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed for he who is mighty has done great things for me and holy. Woo-hoo, is his name. See, what she writes is something she has understood about the scriptures. It's something that she has understood about God. But y- y'all, by understanding the Bible, everybody say, I have to understand it. it. It has to be a word. It's not just me quoting something. I need to understand it. It's not just sitting under it. I have to understand it. It is a word understood. By understanding the Bible, I mean that that we read and we study God's word and we know it. But I think it is tragic that oftentimes as those of us who are professing Christians, we will let days, we will let weeks, we'll let months go by and never even pick up our Bible, let alone reading it, let alone studying it. I think, y'all, the reason many Christians are spiritually anemic is that we've neglected our Bible reading. The Bible for my soul is what food is for my body. The, The Bible is spiritual health. The Bible is spiritual food. How effective would you be? I, I, I think about this, man. I I eat a banana before I minister on Sundays and Tuesdays. I don't really eat anything to really sit on my stomach, but I need I need something in me to 
to help ground me, right, physically. I don't want to be up here jittery. I don't want to be up here with my stomach growling. I'm going somewhere. I, I want to be up here, watch this, distracted and preoccupied by my hunger. Because the truth of the matter is when I am preoccupied and distracted by my hunger, when I am jittery, when I'm focusing on my physical needs, then I really cannot operate in the fullness of who God has gifted me to be spiritually. It's no different than if you're standing at the door greeting. No different than if you're in the finance room counting the money. No different than you're at a drum set or if you're playing a trumpet or a sax or keys. It's no different than if you're holding a microphone to sing praise and worship. It is no different than if you're behind a camera or at a, a, a sound console. The truth of the matter is we may have had a meal in us so that we don't have to worry about being distracted physically. But if you don't have the word in you, then you're being distracted spiritually. And many of us are not living up to the heights of what God can do for us because I don't have enough understood word in me. First of all, y'all, it, it's I grew up, I grew up in a row house in North Philadelphia. Y'all know that, right? Some of you don't really know what a row house is, but on, on the neighborhood, I grew up on North 11th Street in, in Philadelphia, North Philadelphia, right around 11th and Erie Avenues, and, and really 11th and Venango specifically. And on, on our one block, there were 60 homes, 30 on each side of the street. And I lived at 3554, so I lived on, in the, on the 54th house, right, with uh, four more houses to get to the corner. And, 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 and in our homes, we had very tiny closets. Uh, I mean, I'm talking like you really didn't even hang up stuff. Where are my folk that's a little older? Because, see, my young people can't even relate to what I'm about to say. And that's part of the problem. And I pray through the young generation because there are aspects that you'll, things of life you'll never experience that would have helped you become more grounded than you are. But I grew up in a context, in a culture where you didn't hang up stuff in the closet. You folded everything. You folded your shirts. You folded your pants. It wasn't no hanging room. It was just a closet with some shelves, almost like a linen closet. And my parents had, you would have to buy an actual closet because you weren't, they weren't built in. So my parents, in their bedroom, they had um, a cedar closet. It was it was wasn't real tall, had two doors on it. And, and when you it was made out of cedar. And if you know anything about cedar, you know, cedar has an aroma, a very distinct aroma to it. And, and when you would open up their closet, you could smell immediately the cedar. And, and depending on how long it was, the cedar would keep moths out. And, and depending on how long they kept their clothes in there. When you, they pulled their clothes out, you could smell, I'm going somewhere, the aroma of cedar from the closet. Y'all, we ought be in the word so much that there is an aroma of the word on us. That there ought be evidence that I've been grounded in the word, that I've been hanging out in the word. And I think oftentimes when we are ministering in the church, when we are preaching, when we are singing, Y'all, when we are ministering like we are ministering, we are not ministering with an aroma of the word. Y'all, that, that's why I love the song, y'all, that was sung before I got up to preach because it is grounded in, in the book of Numbers. It is grounded in Scripture. It is a reminder of what Scripture has said to us. And y'all, whatever we do, whatever we are preaching and teaching and how we are ministering, we've got to have an understood word. I'm almost, I'm almost ready for point one. But not only does it need to be an understood word, because the Lord is saying to our congregation, whatever I'm about to do in your life is going to be based upon the word that is already in you. You keep dragging your feet and not being at Bible study, and God is saying, I'm not going to be able to do what I could do in your life because I'm only going to move to the extent of the word that's in you. It's got to be an understood word. But not only does it have to be an understood word, I'm almost, at my, I'm almost done. I'm really, I'm almost done my, my introduction. It has to be a used word. If you notice, Mary doesn't just understand the word as she is singing this Magnificat, but she is using the word. Mary, Mary didn't just know it, but she used it. Somebody say, don't just know it, use it. 
Y'all, she was so full of scripture that, that, that she understood I need to use this word. And I want to encourage somebody on this Mother's Day, y'all, that as we begin reflecting upon what God has done, as we begin looking at this issue of having praise on Mother's Day, we got to start using the word. Man, start speaking the word. Oh, I want to park here for a moment. Is there anybody I'm talking to, anybody listening to this message that could look back over your life and say, I'm so thankful that I had a mama that used the word on me, a mama that came into my bedroom and spoke the word over me, a mama that disciplined me based on the word. Come on, is there anybody that can celebrate a mother on this Mother's Day to say, I thank God for a mother that used the word? And y'all, we still have to become men and women that use the word of God. Speak it out over your child's life. Speak it out over your husband's life. Speak it out over your business life. Speak it out over your body. Speak it out over your mind. You've got to get in this word. It's got to be an understood word and it's got to be a used word. The um, president, uh, former president of the American Bible Society received a an email, the email that came from the president of the American Bible Society said, listen, I I bought a Bible. It's a leather bound Bible. I just want to make sure that my, the leather on my Bible doesn't crack. So they asked the president of the American Bible Society, what kind of oil can I buy to keep my Bible leather from cracking? His response was the kind of oil that you need to buy to keep the leather on your Bible from cracking can't be bought. It's not available in stores, but you can get it somewhere. Well, where in the world can I get it? He said it's found in the palm of your hand. Every time you pick up your word, the oil in the palm of your hand keeps that leather from cracking. Who am I talking to? And at some point, I've got to recognize I don't just need to understand the word. I need to use the word. I'm here today because of a mama who used the word. You're here today. Come on, don't fool me because of a mama that used the word. And your child is going to be better off as a mama who uses the word of God. So on this Mother's Day, As we begin taking a moment to reflect upon all that God has done, as I begin to try to unpack this issue, somebody shout grateful praise. As I begin unpacking this issue of grateful praise on this Mother's Day, I want to encourage somebody. You could have a pity party right now because yet here we are, Pastor, another Mother's Day, not in our sanctuary. Pastor, didn't we go through this last Mother's Day where we had to worship digitally? It wasn't that last Mother's Day and you need to post your pictures. You need to post your pictures on this second Sunday. You need to post them selfies. I want to see those women wearing many, many hats, Mother's Day hats. But wasn't it last year that we had to post women wearing many hats? Wasn't it last year that we had to do this same thing? And we could walk around and say, oh, woe is me because I'm not in my sanctuary again this year. We could have a pity party to say, God, I'm still upset and angry with you because you took my mother And I feel like it was premature. Or I could say, God, I've still got an issue with you because you didn't bless me to be able to have a biological child myself. You could go through all that. You could think about everything that's not quite right in your life. You can think about everything that didn't go like you wanted it to go. You can think about how you might want it different. Or instead of doing all that, you can just take a moment and offer God some grateful praise. Y'all, worship is important, y'all. As a creature, we need to worship God. And what the Lord has put in my spirit this Mother's Day is that we need to start offering God a grateful praise. Somebody shout, I'm grateful. I'm grateful that he gave me my mama as long as he did. I'm grateful for the lessons she taught me. I'm grateful that I had her. I'm grateful for those I can influence, even though I may not be a biological mother. I'm grateful for the job I have, even though it may not pay the most. I'm grateful for where I'm living, even though I'd rather live somewhere different. Come on, is there anybody listening to me as I preach today that can say, God, I want to offer a grateful praise 
the blind hymn writer. You, you missed that. I said the blind hymn writer, the blind hymn writer, Fanny Crosby. She described how important this grateful praise was, this worship. She said to God, be the glory for the great things he has done. I dare you to take a moment before I give you point one to, ty to type in something great that God has done in your life. She says to God, be the glory to God, be the glory to God, be the glory for all the things that he has done. Worship, worship. Somebody shout worship because that's what grateful praise is. It's a form of worship. Worship is the creature acknowledging what the creator has done. Let me part. Can we acknowledge all the great things that God has done? It is giving God the glory that is due him because of his greatness. Praising God is one of the highest and purest acts of our faith. Because it is in prayer, one writer said, that we act like men, but it is in praise that we act like angels. You remember that time that David was running from Saul? He found safety in a Philistine town. And in the midst of all of that, he writes Psalm 34. He says, my soul makes its boast in the Lord. He goes on later on in Psalm 34 to say, oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Charles Spurgeon said, Jehovah is infinite and therefore cannot really be made greater. Don't miss that. God is infinite. And because he's infinite, he can't really be made greater. But his name grows in glory. Type that in. Grows in glory. His name grows in glory as he has made known to his creatures. And thus he is said to be magnified. See, when we magnify the Lord, I'm not making him bigger than he already is, but I am helping his name grow in glory. And y'all, I want to just park here for a moment and recognize, y'all, that praise is proclaiming the greatness of God for what he has done. Is there anyone here listening to me preach today on this Mother's Day that can praise God by letting others know what God has done for you? Y'all, has he delivered anybody from some habit? Has he helped anybody work through some problem? I wish I, had, I could see you jumping up now in your living room. Is there anybody else that could look back over your life and say he's healed me from sickness? Is there anybody that can say he blessed me with a child? He blessed me with a grandchild. He blessed me with a godchild. Is there anybody that can say, God, I want to give you thanks for the job you blessed me with. I want to give you thanks that I've got a reasonable portion of health. I want to give you thanks that I'm clothed in my right mind. We've got to take a moment to give God this Mother's Day grateful praise. And as we unpack this story of Mary now being visited by an angel, we start to see that in this Magnificat and even with the, the, the experience and with the visitation leading up to the Magnificat, there are at least three things that I suggest to us today that we ought to give God grateful praise for. I don't say this much, but come on, today, no pity parties. Today, no woe is me. Today, I'm going to give God grateful praise. That's what she does in this Magnificat. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has done some stuff. Grateful praise. Three things. Here's the first point today. First thing I want to lift up today is that this text is teaching us very simple. I just have three simple words for you. Number one, the first thing I want to leave, leave you with is that we should give God grateful praise for our associations. In other words, I need to give God some grateful praise for him putting the right people in my life. My God. Y'all, y'all, we, we need to take a moment and, and, and look back over our lives and say, God, you know what? You have put some good people in my life. I don't know about you. I'm grateful that I was raised by the mother and father I was raised with. By, I'm grateful that I was nurtured and tutored and mentored and loved by the brother that God gave me. I am grateful for every aspect of my family dynamic. I look back over my life and I think about the wonderful people he's connected me with since I've been here in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina. 
I've watched the men and women that have helped mother and father me. I reflect upon the men in ministry that have helped groom me and tutor me. I'm thankful for James Samuel Hall at Triumph Missionary Baptist Church that uh, trusted me to lead his youth ministry. I'm thankful for Dr. Robert Smith and how he has grown me and developed me in preaching and pastoral ministry. What about you? Are there people that you can look at over your life? that You can begin saying, God, I want to thank you for putting the right people in my life. When you and I begin looking at this story, I began reading from the portion of the story where Mary has to visit Elizabeth. In some regards, that breaks my heart. Can I tell you why it breaks my heart? Because so oftentimes we celebrate and rightfully so the fact that what was going on inside of Elizabeth literally leapt at the moment, leaped at the moment that that what that he could, she could identify, he could identify John the Baptist inside of Elizabeth leaping over Jesus who is inside of Mary. And we celebrate that leaping. But what breaks my heart initially is that wherever she was, she didn't trust that the people that were there could celebrate what God was doing in her life. And I want to speak this over your life. If you've got people in your life that can celebrate, I'm going to talk about that in a minute, what God has done in your life. And you ought to be giving God thankful and grateful. Praise God. Thank you for putting people in my life that can leap over what you are doing. God, thank you that you have minimized the haters. God, thank you for the people that have been on my side. God, thank you. And y'all, we have to be careful because even now we must be selective in determining who we share our intimate experiences with. I feel Mary on this because sometimes God can be doing so much in you that not everyone can be trusted in having information about it. You can't, you're going to say amen to this. Some of y'all going to be like, I know that's right, Pastor. Let me, give me a virtual high five right now. Watch this. You can't share your story with everyone. Who's high five and who right now? Everyone can't handle what God has going on in your life. I'm learning, y'all. I should know this. All the years I've been in pastoral ministry, all the years I've been trying to be obedient to the call that God has placed in my life, I would think I would have learned my lesson by now. But the truth of the matter is you can't share your dream with everyone. You can't share your desires with everyone. You can't share your fears and your frustrations with everyone. There's some things that I'm frustrated about that I know everyone can't handle knowing I'm struggling with what I'm struggling with. And y'all, I want to take a moment on this Mother's Day to say, God, thank you for the women that you placed in our life that you have associated us with, women that have helped form us into who we are, It's embedded right there in the text. And I think some oftentimes we miss this. We miss that the reason there are Marys that have been placed on a platform. Oh, God. The reason there are Marys that have been placed in a place of honor. The reason there are Marys that that have been successful in industry. The reason there are Marys that are CEOs of companies. The reason there are Marys. That, that are in places of prominence, the reason there are Marys in the vice presidency of the United States, the reason there are Marys in the state house and Marys in the Senate and Marys that are in school systems and Marys that are in higher education is because God bless her to have an Elizabeth. Your Elizabeth may have been your mama. Your Elizabeth may have been your grandmother. Your Elizabeth may have been your Sunday school teacher, but God blessed you with somebody that had an Elizabeth spirit that when God was doing something in your life, they didn't squelch it. They didn't try to reduce it. They didn't try to beat it back, but they encouraged what was in you. Think about what Mary has to go through. Mary has been told by an angel, by the angel Gabriel, as a matter of fact, told by the angel Gabriel that she's going to have God's son. It's an encounter with an angel and being told you're going to have God's son must have been this earth shaking experience for her. Here's this young girl now. She's got to tell somebody who can handle what God is doing in my life. 
So Mary takes a journey. She goes along the Judean hill country. She begins traveling along. This is not some leisurely stroll on a country road. No, she's going through mountainous territory. She's trying to get to an area that has desert around it. There's a glimpse of the Dead Sea as she walks by. And she sees groves of fruit trees that are growing on slopes that are terraced that are sloped. And, and, and she goes along the main north-south road that is linked to the region's principal cities, which is Jerusalem to the north and Bethlehem and Hebron to the south and beyond the hill country. She sees the eastern slopes that are, are impossible to a desert, that there are impassable desert. And she stretches now 10 to 15 miles to their high point. And she's got to go 3,000 feet near Hebron down to the Red Sea to the lowest point on earth. All of this to just get around somebody that can understand what I'm dealing with. Whoo. How many of us have had to go through some difficulty? just to get around somebody that could handle what I was dealing with. Everyone does not understand what you are carrying. And I'm here to speak over someone's life because we are celebrating this Mother's Day. We, this is grateful praise today. And I'm here to say to you the reason you are where you are is because God placed an Elizabeth in your life to help you celebrate what God was doing in your life. I'm learning, y'all, stop losing sleep over the people that can't celebrate you and start thanking God for the people in your life that do celebrate you. If you don't hear anyone else say it to you, I want you to hear your pastor. I look you right in the eye on this Mother's Day. I want you to know God is for you. I want you to know I celebrate you. I want you to know there are great things in your life. I want you to know you are worthy. I want you to know that God has his hand on you. And if doesn't nobody else say, God, if nobody else says I celebrate you, I want you to hear me say I celebrate you. See, see, and let me say, can I say something real quick? Part of the reason folk can't celebrate you. See, everyone, everyone can't celebrate you. Let me tell you why. In order for me to celebrate you, I have to be good. I have to be content with what he's doing with me. And, and, and y'all, this is important because Elizabeth is old in years and there's been a rightful celebration that God has blessed her to be able to have a child. But the truth of the matter is she's carrying, she's carrying not the Messiah. She's carrying John the Baptist. And in order for her to celebrate the Jesus in Mary, she has to be content with the John the Baptist in her. And I think too many of us, we, we can't celebrate each other because deep down inside, I'm not yet content with what God is doing with me. On this Mother's Day, I'm here to say to somebody, because I'm beating back that spirit of depression, I'm preaching out that spirit of frustration and anger, and I'm here to say to somebody, this Mother's Day, offer God grateful praise, and you offer him grateful praise, because God, if you don't do another thing in my life, I'm content with what you've already done. God, if this is how it has to end, I'm content with what you've done in my life. Let me, let me say something real quick before I give you point two. We all need, I was jotting this down because it was just kind of circulating, percolating in my spirit. I think we all need, I was think. I was reflecting upon the two pregnant women in the text. And I was reflecting upon their interaction with each other. And it made me think about drawing, if you will, um, and uh, a parallelism to being physically pregnant and being spiritually pregnant. And out of that, God had me extrapolating that to say, what then would be the kinds of people that we would need in our life if we were literally holding something, carrying something? And, and he, he put four people in my life. These are four people that, that we ought be celebrating today, that we ought be giving God grateful praise today. He says, first of all, I touched on this already. He said, you need someone in your life who can celebrate what's in you. Y'all, that's a big word, and that's a hard task to fill. We all need someone in our life that can celebrate what's in us. 
You know, every chance I get, I try to compliment and commend our staff and their work and their efforts. It is my way of celebrating what is in them, that we're not walking around hating on one another and being jealous of one another, but I celebrate what is in you, the gift in you. I celebrate the anointing in you. I celebrate your abilities and skills. I celebrate. But not only do we all need someone to celebrate what's in them. Secondly, we need someone to protect what's in us. Because the truth of the matter is, is that she has to carry this baby full term. Both of them do. And in order to carry this baby full term, God has got to put some people in their life to protect what's in them. I'm about to shout my God, because I want you to recognize that we can't always walk around with our chest out and and feeling all like self-absorbed about where I've gotten and how much I have achieved. Because the truth of the matter is we are where we are because somebody, God sent someone in our life to protect what he was doing in me. When the enemy comes in like a flood, this Lord will lift up a standard against them. And I want you to be, I want you to be celebrative, celebrative today that God has placing people in your life to protect what's in you. You know, we don't even know all we've been protected from. We don't even know all that we have been protected from. We all need someone to celebrate what's in us. Secondly, we need someone to protect what's in us. Third of all, we need someone to hold me accountable for what's in me. Oh, God, this is a good word. And, and, and where my mamas, who, 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 who've, had, who, who've been pregnant, and then you recognize that you, you, in order to protect what's in you, that sometimes protecting what's in you means protecting what's in you from you, which means somebody has to hold you accountable for what's in you. Someone has to make sure you're not drinking while it's in you. You're not smoking while it's in you. Somebody needs to make sure you're not getting high and yet you're, you're being held accountable for what's in you. I think oftentimes we have people around us that are so gifted. They're so anointed. They have so much in them, but we don't hold them accountable for what's in them. And then finally, I need someone to help me deliver what's in me. (laughs) Someone that can help me get it out. Someone that can help me birth it. That's why you have to go to a local church, because when you join a local church, In the local church, there are systems and there are structures and there are people. And the job of the systems and the structure and the people is to help you deliver what God has put in you. You need a place to deliver. Somebody shout, I need a place to deliver. Type that in. Tell somebody that doesn't have a church home, you need a place to deliver. You need a place where you can work out what God has in you. And I know we, we try to work it out in the world. We try to work it out in the street. We try to work it out in our own venue but the reality of it is we need a place an ongoing place a place that will develop us a place that will mentor us a place that will challenge us a place where we are both receiving and giving we need someone to help me deliver the first thing I want to lift up is that we need to get to a point on this Mother's Day Sunday where we're offering grateful praise everybody say grateful praise grateful praise for our associations But there's a second thing the text is teaching us, not just grateful praise for our associations, having the right people in my life. But secondly, I need to offer grateful praise out of appreciation. Everybody say appreciation. And what do I need to be showing God appreciation for? I need to be showing God appreciation for his grace. Somebody shout his grace. When you begin looking at it earlier on the text in Luke chapter one. The angel appears to Mary. And when the angel appears to Mary, the angel says, fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Somebody type in the word favor. The word favor means graciousness with God. The angel was telling her that she was the recipient of God's best. She was the recipient of God's grace, that God was literally literally moving in her life in such a way. And I love this because as we look at it, She starts singing about it, and she says, the reason my soul and my spirit, rather, is rejoicing in God, my Savior, is because he's looked on the humble. Somebody shout the humble. She's saying, he found me in my poverty. Oh, 
God. He found me in my lack. Come on, can I help you understand how great God is? When God puts you on a mountaintop, he didn't find you a step away. When God finds you and, and, and God puts you on the top rung of a ladder, he didn't find you on the rung underneath. When God finds me at the ladder, he finds me at the base of the ladder. He finds me in a lowly estate. Come on, Mary, testify. He finds me in a humble estate. When, 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 when God puts me on the top of a mountain, he does not find me just one stretch away. He finds me in the hillside. He finds me in the valley. And, y'all, we have to take a moment to recognize that, oh, God, I feel my heritage coming. That the Lord has brought us from a mighty, mighty long way. How many of y'all remember that little song I brought to Rocky Mount? And we used to sing it at Triumph Baptist Church. I think it's a song we just made up. Look where the Lord has brought us from. Look where the Lord has brought us from with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Y'all, we have to recognize that the Lord, we've come this far by faith. Come on, where my church mothers leaning on the Lord. We've got to recognize that God finds us in a lowly estate and in the midst of lowly estate that God literally moves in my life in such a way that I show appreciation for his grace. Y'all, all of us, lowly estate is manifested, that God is manifesting himself in my life in lots of ways. For some of us, the lives we lived were one of the lowest places I could be. Sin had a grip on my life. And who am I speaking to today? That you think God can't use you because you had hit rock bottom. You know, I've learned this. Y'all, the thing about rock bottom is at least it's solid now. Whole lot of us been on shaky ground, but you, you hit rock bottom, you got something you can stand up on. You got something you can say, you know what, I can, I can jump off of this. I can begin again right here. I hear the Holy Ghost. And God is saying to us, this is your Sunday to begin again. This is your Sunday where you no longer count yourself out because of your lowly estate. That you no longer think that God can't do it just because of how far in the rears you are. And some of you have given up on God moving in your life. Who am I talking to? You won't sing anymore. You won't minister anymore. You won't, you won't participate in ministry or the life of the church anymore because you've looked at how far back you are. You reflect upon your life now compared to other moments in your life. And you feel like you're in a worse place now than you ever have been before. And God is saying, but I'm an expert. I specialize in finding people at the rock bottom. I specialize in finding people that are in a lowly estate. I, I specialize in finding people that feel like they are less than. And when I get done with them, behold, oh God, come on, Mary, testify. Behold, from now on, somebody shout now on, from now on. Now on, all generations are going to call me blessed. Y'all, we need to give God grateful praise out of appreciation. We need to give God grateful praise for our associations. I'm done. Here's the last thing. This is going to make me run. We need to give God grateful praise for acceleration. Acceleration. Y'all, God has done an amazing thing in these verses. Yo, and when you begin looking at, again, I'll focus on both of these mothers, Mary and Elizabeth. It's amazing to me that as we reflect upon it, just a few verses before, Elizabeth is barren. Yo, when you think of barren, what do you think about? When I think of barren, I think about trees without fruit. When I think of barren, I think of tumbleweeds. I think of ghost towns. I think of empty streets. I think of unproductivity. I think of that which is desolate. I think of that which is empty. And miraculously, while her friends were babysitting their grandchildren, Elizabeth finally was at a point in her life where she was out buying maternity clothes. God was saying to Elizabeth, no more shame, no more disappointments. No more dashed hopes. Don't get it. Don't miss it. I'm about to accelerate the path of your life. He doesn't just do it with Elizabeth. He does it with Mary. You've been betrothed to this God. Society doesn't think a whole lot about you, but I'm about to accelerate how you're viewed. 
I'm about to accelerate. She says it right there in the text in verse in verse number 48 in the Magnificat. The same people that saw me in my humble estate, the same people that saw me as less than from now on, every generation is going to call me blessed. From now on, God has moved today in my life in such a way that he's about to put me on the fast track. Somebody shout, I'm getting put on the fast track. That God is about to accelerate. There's no more shame. There's no more disappointments. There's no more dash hopes. That God is saying, I'm about to turn every problem into a possibility. I'm about to take every obstacle and I'm about to make it an opportunity. I'm about to take everything that's mundane and mediocre in your life and I'm about to perform a miracle that God is saying, I'm about to accelerate what I'm about to do in your life. Y'all, y'all, I'm, I'm learning, y'all, that if we hunger for the miracle that we have sought, when we hunger, God, for that which we really, really want God to do, then God hears our prayers and God is able to respond. And when God responds, he responds with acceleration. I, I, I hear God speaking to somebody. I'm almost done. I want to get you. I want you to get out, get off. If your living room, if you can do this, I just want to give you a moment to leap before we get off service. Before I give the invitation, I want to give you a moment to leap. But I'm almost done. This is what God is saying. If you would trust me today, I'm going to accelerate your growth. It's going to be like miracle grow on your life. If you would trust me today, I'm going to take the last 10 years of unproductivity. And when I get done with you, I'm going to make the next 10 years of so be, of, to be so productive that it's going to totally overshadow the 10 years that were not productive. Somebody's listening to me preach. And you're so angry at yourself because you're saying, I wasted five years of my life in that place. I wasted 10 years of my life with that woman. I wasted 15 years of my life with that man. You're going to say, man, I went off to the long, wrong school. Some young person that's in college I'm talking to right now. And you're frustrated because the first two years you chose the wrong major. And God is saying, but let me tell you something. I'm a God of acceleration. And because I'm a God of acceleration, if you would trust me right now, if you would trust me in this season of your life, if you would trust me in what's happening right now, I'm here to tell you that I am able to take all of the years of the past that were not productive and create a productivity that's going to blow your mind. Somebody shout and type in acceleration. That's why you ought to be leaping today. You ought to be leaping today over God's acceleration in your life. Y'all, the, Bi the Bible says at the beginning of the text, that when Elizabeth and Mary encountered one another, that literally it was a leaping inside of Elizabeth. And I want to hear, I want to encourage you to have these four leaps in your life. You, first of all, ought leap for what God is about to do. Somebody shout what he's about to do. I don't know about you, but I'm leaping over what God is about to do. The future is mighty bright. God has some great things in store. There's a healing about to come in your life. There's a promotion that's about to come in your life. There's a favor that's about to be released in your life. First of all, leap over what God is about to do. But not only leap for what he's about to do, leap over what God has already done. Is there anybody that can look back over your life and say, God, I'm leaping over all the mountains you brought me through, over all the storms you blessed me to get on the other side of the other side of over all the mistakes that you didn't let me die in. I hear the Lord. I said all the over all the mistakes you didn't let me die in. Leap over what God has already done. Leap over what God is about to do. But number three, leap for who God has placed in your life. That means that's a leap for your mama. See, everybody can leap on that one. Even if your mama is not still alive, you can still leap before God put her in your life. You can leap whether mama is in the room with you right now. Leap if she's in a different city. Leap if she's gone on to be with the Lord. Leap because we ought to be thankful to God for who he has already placed in my life. And then finally, we all leap over the call that God has placed on me. God has a purpose for you. God has a plan for you. Somebody type in, he has an assignment for you. That's why we keep saying here at Word, we want everybody growing. I told you, you need to get in the Word, but we want everybody serving. And the reason we want everybody serving is because God has an assignment for you. God has a ministry with your name on it. Leap over the assignment. Leap over the call that God has placed in your life. 
This is the God who can do anything. And he can do anything in your life, too. He has all power. And all I've tried to say this Mother's Day is that God wants us to offer him grateful praise. I want everyone to type this in. I'm grateful. This Mother's Day, I am grateful. I'm heartbroken because, Mama, you're not with me. But I'm so grateful that I had you. I'm grateful. Um, it, it hurts because I think about my child not with me. But I'm grateful that I had her for a little while. I'm grateful that I could carry him as long as I did. I hope you're hearing this. This can minister and change your life. God is saying today, this Mother's Day, is a day of grateful praise. Hashtag that. Hashtag grateful praise. Today is a day of grateful praise. You're listening to me. You're watching. Without a personal relationship with the Lord, I have already in the preaching extended this invitation to you. Now is the moment where you have to act. Now is the moment where you've got to say, God, I'm ready. Type on that, type in that link in that chat i want to be saved i want to join the church if you have a prayer request come on this the altar is open it's a digital offer for just altar for just a few more sundays but slowly but surely it's going to be it's going to be an actual altar but this is your moment you, you've got to come to the altar come on make something in your home an altar right now come to the lord Come on, you need a church home. Why do I need a church home, Pastor? Because you need someone to help you. You need the systems and the structure and the people to help deliver what's in you. Pastor, why do I need a church home? Because God put something in you to give away. He put something in you. I'm going to be teaching it in Bible study this week. He put something in you to share. That means he's put something in you to serve. And that means you've got to have a structure to be able to serve. That's a church home. That's a local church. You're feeling down and out. You're feeling rock bottom. And you're, you had never even contemplated the possibility of salvation. But you've heard the word go forth today. And as you've heard the word go forth today, you recognize that regardless, using the humble estate, the lowly estate of Mary, that even in her lowly estate, favor can be given to her. You know, God put people in your life to get you to this point. He put people in your life and you ought to be giving him grateful praise for that association. Somebody said to you today, man, you need to get online and listen to my pastor. Hear the word of God go forth. Meet Jesus for yourself. Give God grateful praise for every association. Give God grateful praise out of appreciation for his grace. That saving grace. Thank you, God. This is your moment. This is your moment. Pastor, what do I need to do? Type in, I want to be saved. Type in. I have a prayer request. I want to join the church. Come on. We want you. We want you. We're receiving you right now. If you're a mother, the greatest gift you can ever give your children is to be in a saving relationship with Jesus. The greatest gift you can give them is to model what it means to serve in a local church. So every mother, I'm talking to you right now. Today is your day of decision. Thank you, God. Come on, y'all. Lift that up. Lift that up. We thank you, God. here for you come on this is your Sunday this is your day Mother's Day come on before you have brunch as a family before you have dinner as a family can you take a moment at the table tonight come on and share what grateful praise you have would you pick up the phone and call your mother call some man or woman in your life express your grateful praise Whew. Come on, he knows everything about you. Come on, real soft, real soft. I want to pray. Come on, get to the altar. I'm praying acceleration in your life. Who receives that? Say, I receive that if you receive that. I'm praying acceleration in your life. Come on, let's pray. Lord, in the name of your son, Jesus. 
God, I am speaking to every person on every outlet. God, whether they are on Facebook or whether they are on our church website or whether they're on Twitter, whether they're on Facebook, whether, God, wherever they are, whether they're on YouTube, right now I'm speaking over every person. For that person that's watching on YouTube on their smart TV, I'm speaking to them. And Lord, I hope you'll touch their heart that they'll receive this one simple word from you, acceleration. That God is saying, I'm about to fast track your success. I'm about to fast track your healing. I'm about to fast track your favor, that which you've been waiting for years for. All the years you lived in dormancy and in barrenness, I'm about to fast track it. For the, for the moment you had to endure living in your humble estate, I'm about to fix it. That every generation, not just the next generation, from now on. Did you get that? From now on. God, release right now in the name of your son Jesus that from now on blessing. That in my family, from now on, there won't be diabetes. Oh, God, I hear you. In my family, from now on, there won't be cancer. In my family, from now on, there won't be heart disease. In my family, from now on, there won't be divorce. In my family, from now on, there won't be depression. From my family, from now on, God, there won't be cancer. There won't be, God, the, the, the struggles that we're having. From now on, there won't be welfare. From now on, there won't be unemployment. From now on, there won't be dropouts. From now on, God, there's going to be something great in my family's life. God, from now on, there'll be education. From now on, there'll be prosperity. From now on, there'll be a closer walk with you. From now on, there won't be anyone left in my family unsaved. From now on, God, from every generation, I'm speaking it out. Every generation will be saved. Every generation will be close to the Lord. Every generation will grow in favor. Every generation will grow in success. Every generation will exceed the previous generation. I'm speaking that over every life of our congregation, those listening right now. Hope you receive it. So God now bless us this Mother's Day. Thank you for every decision. Thank you for what you're doing in this season. Thank you for our associations. God, thank you for that as we, we give you grateful praise and appreciation for your favor and your grace. So, God, we believe great things are about to happen, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, somebody shout amen. Man, I hope today's Mother's Day blessed you as much as it blessed me to preach it. Before we go home and before I pronounce the benediction over your life, some of you are already at home, right, before you log off, I want to say one final time, happy Mother's Day. Would you post your pictures with your hats because we know a woman wears many hats. Would you post your second Sunday health selfie with your mother? Would you change your Facebook profile picture or your social media profile picture for just the next 24 hours? Put a picture with you and your mama. Put your mama up there so we can celebrate each other's mothers and for those people that God has placed in our life to get us to where we are. So mothers, we celebrate you this day on Mother's Day. Before we go home, I want us to receive an offering. Uh, family, we are, you know what we're in the midst of, and we are trusting God. I want to be very, very honest with you. I, I thought I was, I communicated this. I want to be very clear with you. You know, I, we counted the cost before we pushed the button, and we knew it could not get done unless our people all bought into it. So we know that there's a certain amount of money we have to raise if we're going to be back in this sanctuary in September. So we need everyone giving, everyone giving. I mean, everyone giving. So we're asking everyone to give tithes and offerings. We're asking everyone to give to Thrive. That is the fund that is being used to build out our final sanctuary. God has blessed us in this season to be able to literally say, I am a part of of building a physical local church building. What a blessing. So we can do all of the ministries so that we can help people give birth to, the, to what is in them. So you know all the different ways to give. This is not the season for your name to be left out. This is not the season for you to say, I can't. This is certainly not the season to say, I won't. I'm asking partners. If you're a part of another church, but the, the ministry has blessed you, 
You watch on Sundays before your church. You watch our Tuesday Bible study. Would you just partner with us? That's all we're asking. Anything the Lord lays upon your heart, if you would give that this Mother's Day. And we need to be faithful from now on. We need to raise $100,000 above our normal tithes and offerings every month for the rest of this year. Every single month, $100,000 above our normal giving. Y'all, that's a lot of giving. But we can do it if we all do our part. So I want to pray over the offering and pray for you as we dismiss. Thank you for your giving. We're placing all of the various ways you can give today. Lord, thank you for this day of worship. Thank you for this Mother's Day. Would you bless the offering? Would you use it for the building of your kingdom, the spread of your word, the glorifying of your name? And now unto him was able to keep us all from falling, to keep us all from stumbling, and present all of us before his presence with joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be all glory. Lord, this Mother's Day, we give you grateful praise. In Jesus' name, amen.